The Delhi police has now called for the stoppage of the controversial documentary. Bharat Sarkar ki tamam koshishon ke baad bhi Bharat Sarkar ne kya dhir pugal India bhi lada thoda na net. Mera chhara na mujhe alag baat karna. Isliye isliye na dehli ke liye. Aaj sabko dekhna hai. 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 Aaj sabko India has another debate about rape on its hands after the government blocks the transmission of a documentary on the subject. Russia, Ukraine, and the troll army that's invading comment sections on news stories. Plus, students on both sides of the Moscow-Kiev debate have it out on YouTube. And the return of ERT, Greeks, are about to get their state-owned broadcaster back. India is reliving a news nightmare these days, one that goes back a little more than two years, when the story of a horrific gang rape and murder of a young student in New Delhi went global. The case is now back in the headlines because of a documentary on the subject that the authorities in India have banned. The film is called India's Daughter. It features extensive interviews with one of the rapists in which he says with cold emotion, women out on the streets after 9 p.m. deserve what comes to them and that the victim would not have been killed had she not resisted. The film was made for the BBC. However, seven broadcasters from different countries, including NDTV in India, had planned to air it this past week on International Women's Day. That's when the government in Delhi stepped in with the banning order. One minister said that the film was an insult to the dignity of Indian women. Another called it an international conspiracy to defame India. Times Now, one of the most widely watched English language news channels in the country, backed the government, denouncing the film as voyeuristic, a stain on the memory of the victim and questioning why NDTV or any broadcaster would want to show it. This is a story about a painful discussion on violence and rape in India, an outrage machine that's gone into overdrive and a government still new to the job that has managed to draw more attention to this film by banning it than it would have gained had NDTV simply been allowed to broadcast it. Our starting point this week is the Indian capital, New Delhi. The network that was not allowed to broadcast the documentary showed this instead. For 60 minutes, NDTV broadcast the title page. It was an hour-long silent protest. The news ticker in the lower part of the screen did the talking, a stream of messages on the issue. Thousands of miles away in London, the filmmaker Leslie Udwin was watching the story unfold. The most serious thing is that they have banned the, this film without seeing it. And that's quite an indictment when what you're doing is actually clamping down on one of the basic pillars of a democracy, free speech. The silence has been broken. It's atrocious. The such thing is allowed. Every spokesperson gives a different reason for banning it. Some say that it'll cause disruptions and it'll cause violence. Some say, the clearances were not obtained correctly, whereas that has been proved conclusively that clearances were obtained correctly. And that is perfectly legal. So it is obviously just a knee-jerk reaction, and that is why the government has banned it. Setting aside the sensitivities of government ministers, 88% of whom are men, this is the film they didn't want Indians to see. Mukesh Singh, one of six men charged in the case whose conviction and resulting death sentence are now under appeal, speaks extensively from his jail. The film runs for just less than an hour. Singh is on screen, either seen or heard, for almost one-sixth of that, nine minutes and 11 seconds. This is a brilliant film. It's very matter-of-fact, and its obviousness and its simplicity is what makes it powerful. Deeply and fundamentally, it says, we take rape as obvious. We internalize the obviousness of rape. Worse, the man is perpetually innocent. The woman is thoroughly guilty. 
India has dozens of all-news channels in many languages. NDTV, which planned to air the film, and Times Now, which backed the government's ban, are two of the biggest English-language channels on the air. And I don't know what pleasure the documentary filmmaker gets out of getting a rapist to describe the brutality exactly. and extent of the rape, of the act of rape. Well, I think that's ridiculous to say that this film gives a platform to the rapist to perpetuate rape. The film is trying to basically explore what makes a person do it. This is not journalism. This is voyeurism, exactly. this is titillation. It's acceptable because of the hyper-competitive world we live in of one channel uh, trashing the other. But when you see uh, journalists asking for a gag or supporting a gag, as Times Now was, I think it's very worrying because uh, journalists in a country like India, which doesn't have the constitutional protection for freedom of speech like the United States does in the First Amendment. And India has a very dismal record uh, of uh, clamping down on journalists. They've gone out of their way, the Times Group, to actually do a hate campaign against the film. And I think they will hang their heads in shame when they themselves finally see the film. Because, you know, this is the extraordinary thing about this hysterical reaction. The people who have made these outrageously negative comments haven't seen the film. We requested interviews with both Times Now and NDTV. Neither consented. The film has been screened in New York where the US premiere was attended by women famed in Hollywood and Bollywood. They've seen it in Britain and it's been broadcast in five other countries. But Indians have to go online to see what the fuss is about. There was an activist who screened the film in a small village in Uttar Pradesh and has since been taken in for questioning. The documentary remains off limits on Indian news channels which under normal circumstances aren't particularly squeamish about news footage that leaves viewers disturbed. Let me give you an instance. Uh, immediately after their show, news had come in of a rape convict who was dragged out from the jail by a huge mob of thousands and publicly stripped and lynched to death. Horrendous incident. Now, this same channel that we're saying that voyeurism is bad showed the uh, entire stripping. It, it actually showed footage of this horrendous incident. But that was a case of Indians telling their own story, as opposed to the BBC telling it to them. India is the world's biggest democracy, and under Prime Minister Narendra Modi is looking to play a more prominent role on the global stage. <laughs> But it's the government's job to protect India's reputation, not the media's. Times Now and any news outlet endorsing this case of censorship have forgotten that part of the job description. You don't put it on air in my country. It is not for them to advocate on the country's behalf, to spin India's story. They're just supposed to report on it. It's one of those things that when we uh, react to something emotionally, uh, something very uh, horrible happens to us as a family. Let's say, you know, we in India who are invested into this emotionally with a family, we don't want to talk about it. We think we'll be shamed. Another point of view is, let's talk about it and it'll improve. You know, we can make it better. The phrase bringing India into disrepute. I mean, this film was made as a positive statement about the laws that were enacted in response to this rape, the media coverage, the protests, the glimmers of hope, but the supreme irony cannot escape me, which is that the response of the Indian government to the film, without even having seen it, is what is bringing India into disrepute. India, in its current idea of modernization, can't afford to let this message get out. It can speak economics at Davos, but it can't speak culture to BBC. Brilliant film. In fact, I should air it more. Thank God what the state disposes, internet proposes as an alternative. On the download this week, our viewers weigh in on the documentary, India's Daughter, and the fallout from the story. One of the most remarkable things about this film, India's Daughter, which has been banned, is that governments don't ever seem to learn around the world or in India that when you ban a piece of art, uh, people end up consuming it more than they would have originally. And I think that's certainly the case uh, with this movie.
Other media stories that are on our radar this week. In Greece, the recently elected Syriza coalition government is preparing a bill for parliament, which, if passed, would reopen the country's public broadcaster, ERT. The state-owned television channel was shut down in 2013. The government of the day said ERT was closed as an austerity measure and that the channel's management was corrupt and wasteful. The 2,500 people who lost their jobs did not take it well. Some occupied the studios and attempted to keep ERT on the air, accusing the government of closing the channel because of its critical reporting, which was out of step with Greece's privately owned channels, the bulk of which backed the government and the policy of austerity. ERT was replaced by a low-cost channel known as Nerit, which employs only a skeleton staff. Those employees will move to the new ERT, with the government saying that most of those laid off in 2013 will be rehired. The Syriza government says that the funding for ERT will not come from the state budget. Rather, it will come from license fees collected through power utility bills. The Ethiopian government has been accused of being behind cyber attacks and spying on journalists working at an independent channel that covers the country country from offshore. The channel is Ethiopian satellite television, ESAT, and it's based just outside Washington. According to a report published March 9th by the Toronto-based Internet Watchdog Citizen Lab, ESAT journalists based in the U.S. have been targeted by spyware attacks traceable back to the Ethiopian security agency, known as INSA. Citizen Lab first reported on these kinds of attacks about a year ago. It identified spying software developed by a firm called Hacking Team based in Milan, and Citizen Lab says that Hacking Team continues to work for the Ethiopian government despite its involvement being revealed last year. ESAT is one of the few independent news sources covering Ethiopia, and if its system was successfully hacked, the fear is that some of their sources within Ethiopia may now be known to the authorities in Addis Ababa. The U.S.-based Press Freedom Organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists, says the government there is among the world's leading jailers of journalists. The HSBC tax avoidance story brought to light by the biggest media leak in banking history and an unprecedented journalistic collaboration involving reporters in more than 40 countries may end up claiming casualties in the British media establishment. Rona Fairhead has been a non-executive director at HSBC ever since 2004. She chaired its audit committee until 2010, which one would think would put her in a good position to know about tax dodging among HSBC's clientele. That's only a part-time job, though. Fairhead is also the head of the BBC Trust, the governing body of the British state broadcaster. She appeared before a parliamentary committee this past week where her line of defence on what she knew about HSBC and when she knew it, ignorance, was rejected by an opposition MP who urged Fairhead to quit her BBC job. I really do think may, that may, you should may, consider may, your position may and I, you should think about resigning and if not, I think the government should sack you. Shortly after the HSBC story broke, Peter Oborn, the chief political commentator at the Telegraph newspaper in the UK, resigned, saying that the Telegraph refused to cover the HSBC story. Oborn wrote that the paper's owners, the Barclay brothers, are reliant on HSBC loans for their other businesses and that the Telegraph did not want to lose the bank as an advertiser. The murder of an opposition politician in Moscow, Boris Nemtsov, is the latest big political story to come out of a country where the media are a story of their own. Over the past year or so, a new battleground has emerged in the information war between Russia and its Western rivals. And you can find it in the comments section of just about any news site that covers Russia, the Kremlin, President Putin, or the battle over Ukraine. And if you're going to go to war, it's best to have an army on your side. In this case, a troll army. Troll armies are on a mission. The Russian one is reportedly paid by the state to go online and either comment favorably about its political masters or pollute the discussion with profanity or antagonism to the point where nobody else wants to take part. News organizations did not see this coming, but they cannot help but notice the number and nature of the comments they're getting. So how do they handle it? Usually by shutting down the debate, which for an army of trolls amounts to mission accomplished. And Russia's is by no means the only government that's doing this. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the troll army that takes its marching orders from the Kremlin. When opposition leader Boris Nemtsov was murdered on February 27, two days later, tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets of Moscow to protest. Organized, even galvanized online. It was the same story back in 2011, 
when similar numbers protested against Vladimir Putin's decision to run for president a third time. Before 2011 elections, Kremlin did not pay that much attention to internet and what was go especially what was going on on the social media, I mean like Facebook and Twitter. That, that's why the opposition could control those networks. They started paying more attention. Uh, to what was happening there and trying to sort of insert themselves into that conversation. So you will see, for instance, a particular news story breaks on Twitter and on Facebook, and then you will see these masses of accounts start commenting on what happened using the exact same sentence. This may look like an innocuous suburb in St. Petersburg with regular employees on their way to work, but according to numerous reports in opposition outlets like Novaya Gazeta, Within these buildings, the Kremlin is funding entire offices, a so-called troll army, where Russians are paid to operate multiple social media accounts. They scan the web for stories related to Russia in the mainstream media, and then they comment on them. And they have been known to post hundreds of comments a day. And what these people basically do is they compose posts based on the directions that are given to them every day, and then they go and comment on each other's posts also. And, you know, the theme of the day can be anything, but it's usually a very sort of pared down, simplistic version of events as the Kremlin wants to present them. I, I really like, I don't, I don't like these people. They get paid from the West. Uh, they want to have a bloody revolution in Russia. I don't trust it. I like Putin. Putin is the best, blah, 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 blah. The goal is to pollute the discussion and make sure that people will just leave this discussion. There will be not more people joining in and understanding the point of view of, of the person who started it. The upsurge in pro-Kremlin commentary online has been noticed not only in Russia, but across the globe. In May last year, the UK's Guardian newspaper reported that its moderators were dealing with around 40,000 comments a day and had noticed what they called an orchestrated pro-Kremlin campaign, particularly around its Ukrainian coverage. We compared the number of comments that coverage was receiving with the paper's Syrian coverage over the same period. On average, its Ukraine reports were attracting 10 times as many comments. Ironically, one of the best characterizations of this trend came from a comment in the paper's comment section about all the comments. One need only pick a Ukraine article at random pick any point in the comments at random, and they will find themselves in a sea of incredibly aggressive and hostile users who post the most biased, insightful, pro-Kremlin, anti-Western propaganda that seems as if it's taken from a template. So repetitive are the statements. Still, that's not exactly a smoking gun or proof that the otherwise invisible hand of the Kremlin is behind the trolling. But the Russian government is on the record as saying that the Western media are biased on the Ukraine story a view shared by many Russians, not just the ones in the comment section. In Ukraine, we have 8 million ethnic Russians. This is a problem which touches a lot of Russian families. And when we had American media, Western media, telling us that the people in Ukraine want to be with Russia, that was a completely different thing. And that is the urgent question tonight. Will the Russians stop in just Crimea or invade further into Ukraine? And when the Western media got into this overdrive, a lot of people were very upset, offended, and you, Putin didn't even need to ask anybody to comment or to write because the overwhelming feeling in Russia was that the Americans have stepped over the line. Governments often try to control what is said online. North Korea created a sovereign internet that it controls directly. China filters the net, blocks websites that are deemed undesirable. But web users have grown adept at circumvention. So rather than trying to silence debates, more and more governments are trying to influence them. Israel has recruited bloggers that it says will bring their arguments to anti-Zionist websites. The British Army announced that it plans to set up a special force of Facebook warriors. So the Kremlin's troll army is by no means alone on the battlefield. Uh, Television remains the most popular medium in Russia, with an estimated 74% of the country routinely watching the national channels. The so-called troll army was built to do its work online, but its influence reaches right into the mainstream media. Basically what happens is there's something, some sort of news breaks out, and then there's this flood of mass commenting or mass 
tweeting or mass posting by all these people. And then the mainstream Russian media run the story, usually titled like bloggers uh, unhappy with X or internet users are upset with Y. And they basically just point back to all this fake outrage that is happening online. That also shows that there is some sort of cooperation between television and uh, what is called the troll army. So there's some sort of coordination that happens, not systematically, but on, on the main points, on the main stories certainly happens. The apparent slip up was quickly picked up and mocked on social media. So this kind of manipulation is clearly there and is clearly quite powerful, I would say, because you reinforce with one platform, reinforce the others. Or well, you could use that platform to sabotage. And the Russian internet law passed in 2012 Websites are liable for all content on their pages. In October last year, the Moscow Times, an English-language daily, suspended its comment section after all the vitriol its Ukrainian coverage was attracting. A lot of websites have closed their comment sections, not just the Moscow Times. Not necessarily for legal reasons, but just because there was so much hate and so much abuse in the comments that it was not, the discussion was not productive. And uh, this is exactly when, when this kind of policies work, because that l limits discussion online, that limits the possibility of people to have their own mind. And that is uh, exactly in uh, the line of what uh, the authorities wish. For news outlets trying to connect with audiences, every discussion abandoned is an opportunity lost. For the government in Moscow, every unflattering news report questioned is a battle won. It's information warfare, and the Kremlin's troll army marches on. More voices on the download now on troll armies and what they do. The Russian government has used a series of restrictive legal measures, including laws on extremism and the now mandatory registration of popular bloggers to the media watchdog and more, to curtail the freedom of independent voices to operate in the Russian media landscape while simultaneously increasing its own voice in the online sphere, making uh, the government voice now the loudest and strongest uh, in Russia's media landscape. Finally, even before the fall of President Viktor Yanukovych just over a year ago in the ensuing war over Ukraine, there were already conflicting narratives between media outlets serving audiences from both Moscow and Kiev. So when university students in Ukraine used a video on YouTube to call on their Russian student counterparts to listen to their version of the story, the Russians responded in kind. The two sides then talked about the coverage of the crisis, the information barriers that exist between them, as well as the importance of verifying the news that's reported. Not that a single piece of social media interaction is likely to shift the story. However, it is evidence of the younger generation's suspicions over how Ukraine is being covered. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Мы, студенты Национального авиационного университета, обращаемся к вам, студентам Московского государственного технического университета гражданской авиации. Мы призываем вас поднять информационный занавес. Проверяйте то, что слышите. Сомневайтесь в том, что видите. Здравствуйте, уважаемые украинские студенты. Нам, как представителям российского студенчества, не безразлична судьба братской Украины. Мы увидели ваше обращение. Мы услышали вас. Вы слева, мы справа, а между нами километры недопонимания. Между нами стали сказки про фашистов, украинских националистов, правый сектор и бандеровцев. Вот что на самом деле разделяет нас. Информационный шум. Вы называете бандеровцев, правый сектор, нацистов, сказкой. Но неужели жертва Майдана, Одесский дом профсоюзов, разбомбленные города Донбасса тоже являются сказкой? И все это вы называете информационным шумом? Братья, задумайтесь. Ровно год назад в нашей стране был свергнут диктаторский режим правительства Януковича. Это революция достоинства нашего народа, обычных людей со всей Украины за свои права и свободы. Год назад в вашей стране случился антиконституционный переворот. Вы называете избранным украинским народом президента Януковича диктатором, узурпирующим власть. Вы говорите, что стали более сплоченными в то время, как идет гражданская война.